Yeah, let's start talking about this chapter. Today we will talk about chapter three and chapter four. So the idea is that to talk rigorously about type systems, we first start to define them formally. And so this chapter start to introduce a lot of formal concepts, which may not be familiar for all of you. So just feel free to interrupt at any point. Uh, the hi, language I is, just, hi. I just have one question. So this is the first time I'm attending this. Uh, is there like, so we're starting from chapter three. Is there anything I need to know from the previous chapters? Uh, no, it's a theory, okay. that's it. All right. <laughs> you're you're awesome. good Thank to you. go. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Chapter two, chapter two is a review of math stuff. And okay. Okay, yeah, sets so, and offer. Okay. All right. Yeah, That's... so if you haven't read that, it's okay. Chapter one is just like general introduction to the book. Awesome. So Sounds it, good. Yeah, Thank you. Fine. <laughs> Thank you. And but also if you feel confused at any point, feel free to ask. So yeah, this chapter just defines a very small language with numbers and booleans where basically it's a calculator, but we can also do some if else stuff. And but this language can be a vehicle for introducing some stuff like abstract syntax, inductive definitions, proofs, which you may or may not care about, but in programming language, we can do proof on them. And evaluation to actually running the program and also modeling of runtime errors. Chapter four is the implementation of this language in OCaml. And chapter five to eight, chapter five to seven, look at another language, the untyped Lambda calculus, which has a bit more like functions and then chapter eight, start at tab system. So chapter eight, go back to add tab system to our little language and chapter nine, start to add those to Lambda calculus. So until chapter seven, we have so-called untyped language or dynamically typed language. Until chapter eight start, we will study the type system. So first we will see what this language has. It's it just has a Boolean constant true and false. Conditional expressions, which is if else. And also we have numeric constant zero. Interesting, interestingly, we have arithmetic operators successor, but also predecessor. So we can add to a number, but also subtract from a number. But we will later we will see the semantics of those things. There is a test whether a number is zero. So this is the whole grammar of this language. And
you may or may not familiar with this idea. This is called uh, standard BIF. So T colon colon equal means uh, we start, we are defining a term and a term can be, for example, true or false or something like this. But also, for example, in this if else case, if then else itself can contain can contain another terms. So this definition is also recursive. I'm kind of surprised that he used T three times. Um, is this common in BNF uh, not to allow different letters for possibly different terms? Say if T then S else you yeah the the t is it's it's uh, telling you which not uh non-terminal yeah it goes in that position and it just happens that this language only has one class of expression which is terms um so yeah. that's why they're all t's it's just right. saying that you can stick any term in where there's a t so t yeah, is more so... of a type rather than instance yeah 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 it's yeah, but also because language, we will talk about type later, and type will be another another non-terminal we talk about. So we sometimes call this as a sort to distinguish from type. But yeah, the idea your idea is right. Uh, so sorry. So are you, are you guys saying that T can stand for let's say if false then true else? is zero T, is that what you guys are trying to say? That the T can take in any of the other possible terms? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. T can be any of those alternative, in, including those recursive stuff. So yeah, you can, that's what, how you can have, for example, nested if. You can have T is an if uh, then else, and then the inner T is also a if, if then else, for example. Okay. So it's start to talk about some terminologies where in here they also call the T, the non-terminal T as a meta variable. There's also a way to say it because it's a it's a placeholder. And but also programming languages will have variables, not in this language, but later we will have variables. So to distinguish, we call it meta variable. And also, also a previous comment is whether we can use the different letters. Yes, we will. For, for this part, it's okay to just use T because we need to describe the meta variable T, uh, non-terminal T and we using T I think is clear, but later when we need to have different, terms, then we will use some other letters. So for the moment that what terms and expression are used interchangeably, but really this is ex expression. This T should be an expression because later when we introduce another term, which is type, then we need to see, oh, there is an expression, but also a type, which is different.
But this book is backward. No, I don't think it's backwards, but I mean, like in, I, it's true that in many languages, it, people call terms expressions, but I think academics, you know, terms are no, things that are, are values. Or, is, well, yeah. my explanation, so yeah. my explanation is wrong. I should say that. <laughs> yeah, so term expression is like the basic this stuff, but also we will have type expressions. Yeah. And term is just for like the specialized sense of phrases represent computation. So yes, here are some examples of the program where we can evaluate this program and get a result. And this expression is like if false, so we go to this branch and get one. And the successor of zero is one and predecessor of one is zero and we get zeros and then we test that it's true. And this paragraph just talk about notation, like this is the input and this arrow symbol means it's the output. Also, here's a comment about parentheses. Parentheses are used to distinguish the different precedents and uh, associativity, which is not needed after parsing. So this book defines so-called abstract syntax, which doesn't have those stuff. Also, in this little language, it's possible to not use parentheses. It's possible to have, but uh, it's we don't we don't have ambiguity in the grammar. But later languages will be more complicated, and parentheses helps reading. So. Also, another comment is that result of an evaluation will be a subset of the term. And such terms are called value. So basically, value is in this language is true, false, zero. And we can't get off the successor and predecessor, but otherwise those form and this form will guarantee to be reduced to something else. Also, also just it will, we don't actually have numbers like as machine integers, for example, instead we have this suck and the pre predecessor notation and to make it easier to read, we will actually write the successor, 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 for example, of zero as just as three, but they're actually in this form. Also, the syntax of the term permits to form some weird terms like this successor of true, which makes no sense. Also, if zero, we can't put an integer as a condition.
And that's what a type system is used for. Type system can immediately exclude those programs, but currently we are dealing with uh, untyped language. So it's fine to write this way and only it will become runtime error. So this 3.2 talks about that there are equivalent, equivalent ways of defining the syntax of our language. Grammar is usually how people defining stuff because it's compact. But really, it's, we can use this inductive definition. So this is called inductive definition because it is also kind of recursive. So in this definition, uh, the set of terms is a set such that those like true, false, and zero are a term. And also inductively, if T1 is a term, then, then it's successor and predecessor and it's zero is a term. And also if like T1, T2 and T3 are terms, then if then else is a term. You know, when it says smallest set, uh, I wonder if uh, existence at times is issue, uh, whether such smallest set exists. You can just take the intersection of all sets which contain it. You, you know, there is one, like by line one, there is, it's not empty, so. Yeah, yeah, we definitely have three at least. And then we have those two classes. Yeah, and I think smallest just means that you don't throw extra junk in there, right? If it wasn't smallest, yeah. then you could throw whatever you wanted in there. There's some stuff exercises later on here as well, which goes into the smallest things. And if you go in and you prove it, it's fairly convincing. Yeah, I haven't done the exercises yet. I plan for like doing the exercises for chapter three and four for the next meeting. So also like the grammar, we don't have parentheses because we are going to represent terms as a tree, as a set of trees, I should say, not as a set of strings. So we don't need to parse them. It's already in as a tree format. So we don't need like parentheses, but when we write them, then parentheses can be helpful. Also, we can use inference rules format to define a term, which is which is very uncommon, but also so inference rules are very useful to define like actual semantics rules later. So for inference rules, inference rules is like, those three are uh, axioms. The books omit the bar here, but I think other texts often just include this bar with no 
upper side. Because this read to me like if it's a judgment and I don't know it's true or false. With a bar, with a bar is clear, it's an axiom. But in here, just the books just use those as axiom. Like true is a term, false is a term, there is a term. We don't have any bridge condition. But then this bar can be read as if else. So if T1 is a term, then suck of T1 is a term and et cetera, et cetera. For all of those is like, if something, then something, if something, then something. And yeah, each rule can be read as if we have some, we can establish the statement in the premise, then the conclusion will be true. Yeah, also T is the smallest set satisfied these rules are not stated explicitly, but yeah, we, we can't just throw some random junk in T and say it still satisfies those rules, but not, that's not how we do things. And, and rule without premises are called axioms in the books. Inference rules, including like both axioms and those those proper rules that has premises, but also for axioms, the book just omit the vertical bar. Also, yeah, to be completely pedantic, those inference rules are actually like rule schemas because at least for those, because we have variables, meta variables in them. Yeah, so the, just a clarification on that. So what that means is that these are like, uh, the schemas are, ways of generating rules, right? So you might have a rule that says yeah. like true is a term, then suck true is a term, right? And that's that's the actual yeah. inference rule. But uh, this this thing here is a way of generating all of those. Yeah, because yeah, it's it's hard to, or even impossible in this case to enumerate all the rules. So we need to use variables, but yeah, actual rules can be stamped out from this. So this is another another definition. Which is a way to gen generate the generate the different terms. So like we have S0, which is empty set, and then S1, S2, et cetera, where we just introduced those rules to expand the set from like the, its predecessor. And then we do a union to get I find it surprising they don't put those three in the S0 though. 
but it works. So S0 is an empty set and S1 contains only constant. And start from S2, we have more stuff added. And here are some exercises that we will, we will do that in the next meeting. So for the next meeting, we can put some optional exercises. If you want to do that, then you can do that. And we will talk about them in the next meeting. So we have a bunch of different definitions. They are equivalent, but yeah, those two definitions simply characterize the set as the smallest set satisfies a certain so-called closure property. So this is like a jargon, but Basically, just the closure property is just like this, this, this property, like all the terms need to satisfy this property. And and this definition, the set definition is uh, more, it's more of a way to construct individual elements. And, but all those definitions are equivalent and we can, with one definition, we can write another. So yeah, we can use the proof to improve that we are defining the same set. Oh, so here's a comment that true false zero is included in here rather than here because yeah because we in here we say it's like t1 is in s4 s is in si rather than in like a union from s0 to si so Well, it so seems like you could yeah, actually. It seems like you could actually define it the other way, but then maybe some yeah, proofs are harder. You, yeah, you can define it the other way, but yeah, this way is simpler. Yeah, I agree. Like if you do the exercises, the fact that it's only from SI is just like it, it follows very simply. Or well, I mean, you know, you have general induction as well, but well, this is more straightforward. Right? <laughs> it's easier to prove. Skip this proof, but yeah, these kind of things are like for exercises. We will do those kind of things where we yeah, just prove certain properties. For this, it proves that this definition is equivalent to this definition. Also, this proof goes uh, like an in induction on the natural numbers, but we in this book we will also see other form of induction, 
like induction on natural numbers are the simplest induction, but there, there are, for programming languages, there are so-called structural induction, which can be also very useful. So, Structural induction basically we just instead of induction on natural number we where we can consider it as special cases for this structural induction just uh, do induction on the structure on pretty much on the grammar directly. So if if T is a term, then for then one of those three things must be true. Like T is a constant, or T is a they, you know if in the, those like suck predecessor or is zero form for some other T. All T has a form if and else for some other T, for some other T's. So that's how we can do induction. We prove this. And then for, for those cases, we need to inductively prove that if, if something for T1 hold, then it hold for the whole. Form and that's how we do structural induction, basically. But I think the important part here is actually the smaller. So the, like the T1 yeah. and T1, 2, 3 are always smaller, which means eventually you're going to get down to a constant. And then yeah. you can prove it for the, if you prove it for the constant, then you prove it for, and all of the smaller stuff, you proved it for everything. Yeah. So eventually, eventually, that means if we prove the constant and we prove the other rules, we get we covered everything because it, eventually it will reduce to a constant. It's the same as mathematical induction, like eventually we'll get to zero. Like, oh, uh, this. This definition, this definition, inductive definition, where we inductively define the set of constants appear in a term T as this not like those are trivial. Those are also like set of constant appeared in those are just set of constant appear in the sub term. This is only complicated case where we need to do a union. And we can use this kind of inductive definitions to define some other stuff like uh, size of a term, which is, this is like a size of the tree. Where we have the base case, we have those cases we produce plus one, we have those cases where we need to add the three sizes of subterms together and add one. We can also define so-called depths, which is the height of the tree. And then we, just in this if then else case, we need to do a max.
So, so with those definitions, we can do some inductive proof. For example, we can prove the number of constant in, uh, in a term is less than or equal to the size, which seems very intuitive, but we can actually prove that inductively. I think I will skip this proof as well, but you just can prove those stuff, those trivial stuff, but then the same kind of structural induction can be used later to prove non-trivial stuff for a language. And yeah, we can do structural induction, just like full structural induction, but also we can do some induction on depth and on size. It's a kind of a more limited form, but for certain problems, okay to do that. And for the structural induction, which this is the more general case where for each term S, we need to given like PR for all immediate subterms R, we need to show PS for some property. If we can, of course, some terms don't have subterms, then we just don't have this promise. We only need to show PS for those constants. And if we can show that for all the terms, then we get, we should say the property hold. So here talks about like, yeah, structural inductions have the similar structure where yeah. So in, in natural induction, we have like the case of the zero and then case of some other number, which is, which also can reduce to a smaller number. And in this case, it's also structural induction where you have some like those constant case and then cases like other syntactic form where we can reduce to some subterms. And that's really the structural induction just like that. Oh. Uh. All right, I'm I'm a little bit lost track of the chat, but I will read them later. Three point four talk about the semantic style. So we switch gears from the proofs to other stuff, and we talk about there are different semantic styles. There are operational semantics, which is like we have some abstract machine that executes a program. We describe how this machine execute 
the program. The, yeah, the machine is abstract in the sense that yeah, it does not have any machine code rather or instruction set. Rather, it's just it's, had, the abstract machine just have some state, and then we have some transition function to for each state give us the next state. That's how an uh, abstract machine is defined. And also a comment that we what we define here is called small step operational semantics, which if we read Harper's book, it also uses small step uh, semantics. But there are also yeah, sometimes called structural operational semantics. There's also a counterpart called a big, a big step style, where we just do an evaluation and get the result. And also sometimes it's useful to have different operational semantics like one small and one big, and then just prove, we can prove they are, they are equivalent. I guess operational semantics are what people are familiar with, but they're also like denotational semantics and axiomatic semantics. Unfortunately, I, I really can't give too much to say about those two because I'm not familiar with those. So the book comments that uh, those two are used, used to be more popular than now, but then we find them have like obvious limitations like Denotational semantics can't describe non-determinism and concurrency and for axiomatic semantics procedures. So we just don't like even academics find it hard to use those. But yeah, those does have advantage that it is easy to prove stuff where it's abstract from like, the details of evaluation. So I had a professor used to comment that operational semantics is like an interpreter. It immediately interprets your program. And denotational semantics is like a compiler, even though it is more compile your program into a mathematical form rather than some machine language. And axiomatic semantics is like a theorem prover. I think this is a good analogy. So the book will use operational semantics. It is used exclusively in this book. So we will never see those two again in this book. And even in Harper's book, we mainly talk about operational semantics and not those two. So let's define the operational semantics, but first for booleans. And with operational semantics, we can actually do evaluation of the program. So 
So we have a syntax of booleans in here and then evaluation is, we have different rules for if the condition is true and the condition is false, then we train, we do a transition to different terms. Notice, yeah, this is a small step because we just do one transition. If it's a big step, then we will say we, if we will have some promise that if like T2 evaluate into something, then, then this will evaluate to that value too. But yeah, since we are doing small step, we just do one thing at a time. So do one thing at a time. And this is the only more complicated rule, which is that say if T1 can step into something like T1 prime, then if there else we also reduce to like if T1 prime, then T2 else T3. And if we have these three rules, these three rules, then we just can run them recursively. So whatever complicated stuff is at, at this T1 position, it will eventually become true or false. But there are also possibility it becomes a number, but in that case, we stuck and we will talk about that later. Yeah, here is a comment. What these rules do not say is just as important as what they do say. So the constants true and false do not evaluate to anything because they are what they are terminals. They are constants, so we don't need to do anything with them. Also, there are no rule to evaluate the then and else branch of an if before evaluating if itself. So, Yeah, those, yeah, this does not evaluate into this form. Instead, we must evaluate this condition first and then go into the corresponding branch. So yeah, this, that's how we define the evaluation, so-called evaluation strategy for conditionals. And here is a comment that different char character of the rules sometimes emphasized by referring like those two rules, we do actual computation as computation rules. And this rule care about the evaluation order, we just call them congruence rule.
And here gives more definition. First, like an instance of inference rule, which is like be consistent to replace each meta variable with by the same term in the rules conclusion, and, and also all the promises. Yeah, for example, this is an instance of this rule because we we don't have any variables in there anymore. And then we can, with this definition, we can talk about for each instance or for all instance, we can talk about stuff like that. And a rule is satisfied by a relation if for each instance we add either the conclusion is in the relation or if the promise is not. So yeah. If yeah, if the premise is not, then it can also be said it's satisfied. So can the relation be anything other than true and false? Uh, so relations are just sets, right? And it's a yeah, like it's a like uh like down here and three five three. Uh is that right? I mean you can have a relation on uh like the, actually, so right, the example relate the relation we're looking at right now is this arrow relation, which has two yeah. arguments, right? And yeah. uh, like here where it says t goes to t prime. Um, but you can have a relation with more arguments and it's just yeah, the set yeah. of things that are, you know, match the rules. So a relation is a set. Yeah. And those are kind of stuff talked about in chapter two. So I guess, yeah, chapter two is not strictly required for reading chapter three, but still it's yeah good to have some background about relation. Also in like mathematical induction chapter to talk about that. So how should we understand the T arrow T prime? Um, this is a relation that, uh, what are T and T primes again? Uh, so T is, so this is like one step of a computation. You can think about that. So for example, we define it here. So for like, if true, then T2 else, T3 become T2. That's one step. And if false, become T3, so, but also we have, yeah. Right, T and T prime are just uh, term expressions, right? Yeah. And uh, the set is just all the possible terms that get reduced to other terms in one step. So it's a really big set. It has every possible program and every, you know, every step that you could possibly take on those, those programs. Yeah. I think Mike did a better explanation than I ever did. And then, but you could have things like uh, if I, like we had one of those bad programs, like uh, successor of true, you know, that doesn't go to anything. So that's not going to be in the relation. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, we just don't have rules for them. And that's why we say it's stuck. So, uh, so I guess where I'm confused. So previously we have this definition, inductive definitions, right? Yeah. And now we have rules. Why do we need rules actually? Aren't those inductive definitions enough to describe the set of all terms? Uh, 
So what do what yeah, do we... it describes the set of all terms, but it does not describe the meaning of those terms. Uh -huh. I think inductive yeah, so, definition yeah. was about syntax, whereas right yeah, now yeah. we went into semantics. Well, yeah, exactly. these, these these are inductive definitions as well. This this evaluation thing here, that's an inductive de definition of this relation. Um, yes, it, inductive definition is a, a general idea. So, but it doesn't add anything to the set, right? Because the terms are no. defined free. Okay. No, it doesn't add anything to the set of term. Right. So we have lots of different inductive definitions, right? We have the inductive definition of terms, like on the yes. left here, this is where it says syntax, and we have inductive definition yes. of values, v, and then we have the inductive definition of evaluation. Yeah, and all of them are defining sets. Exactly what you said before, like sets of relations, right? Uh, all right, yeah, relations are sets, right? Yeah, it's opposite. Uh, relations are set, not right. Like relations and, are so smaller. We and we this... don't talk about the set of relations. Like we start with small relation, we can derive our relation, so we get a set of relation. No, is is not the uh, case. The rules are just saying what stuff is in the the set, right? There's yes. there's only one set here, which is the the relation the the set that describes all the pairs that you know give us these arrows. And okay. The rules are, are the rules are. I mean, the rules are describing that set in the same way that the syntax is describing the set of terms. Mm -hmm. But you know, yeah, we have two. We basically have two sets here. If you want to look at them as look at them as sets. Yes, I, I get it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. And so, the, so the last rule, uh, the E E rule, should we understand it in a sense that, uh, yeah, the E E rule. Should we understand it in a sense that if T evaluates to T prime, then conditional evaluates to the next conditional? That's what this is saying? Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So basically, it means we need to always, with these rules and those two rules, means we need to always do the evaluation of this condition first. So uh, we can see the like this condition is strict, where where those two are lazy. If you think in uh, actual programming languages, mm. we always like we always need to compute the condition to true or false, and mm -hmm. then we do something else, basically. And when we say to compute to, I mean, what does it mean? You can you can tra transform t1 into t1 prime yeah and does it mean for instance reduce complexity because i mean t t1 and t1 prime can be equivalent uh, values but uh, i guess there's no stipulation about that right as long as t1 they can't and be, they can't be equivalent they are like in these rules we we don't have say like true can evaluate into true so yeah, they can't be stuck. We only have three rules. All the rules reduce complexity. Yeah. So and, and maybe this... we could do the example after three point five three. Yeah. 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 We we can move on. Well, I think walking through an example may help explain. So like this one step evaluation relation is the smallest binary relation. So it's a binary because we have T and T prime. And the smallest here again, because we want to say we don't want to add random junks into the into the evaluation rule.
And yeah, this is an example we define S as if true, then false, else false. T as if S, then true, else true, and U as this. And yeah, we can derive from this to this. Notice that them and else part are the same. So we really need to derive S to false because remember from the rule, we always step the condition first. And then, yeah, we can have this deriv so-called derivation tree format where S is derived into false and- That's a previous rule, right? Which yeah, is if the, true then false, else false, that means implies false. So well, yeah, it's yeah. an axiom, right? Okay. Yeah, it's pretty- Yeah, it's a, it's a when it's a like second rule, I think, yeah, it's yeah, this yeah. rule. And so right. this is an example of T1 going to T1 prime, the S reducing to false. Yeah, S reducing to false. And, but we, yeah, then we can continue because what now we have, we have uh, T become if false, then true else true. So, yeah, we basically it says T and U are equivalent now. Also, here's a comment that this derivation tree is more like a der derivation list we have. But for more complicated cases, we may have a tree with like multiple premises we need to we need to derive. So did does the example help explain the evaluation relation anymore? I'm okay with uh, a T turning into U, but if we scroll a little, what is the last line saying there? If T then false, else false. If you then false, else false. So what's T turning into you? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so T turning into you means like this can be turned into this. Mm -hmm. By okay. applying, so, yeah, by right. applying the third rule. Yeah, basically the premise of the, the condition of the if is the same. If the T is the same as you, then if T is the same as if you. Yeah. yeah. This is kind of backwards, like this tree is going top down, but it's kind of probably backwards from what you would do, like if you were trying to figure out like, you know, the thing, like if you're looking from the expression, you do this, but this is just kind of proving, oh, this expression actually exists in the set, right? Like that we can build up from here. Yeah, but, but right. yeah, also but, like just, if you are doing a proof, you can start from conclusion and then derive backward, but it's still usually writing in this format. Yeah, right, right, right. Like this is kind of the end, this is the end work of like scribbling some stuff down and figuring it out. <laughs> yeah. So at some point it was talking about the state of machine, but uh, uh, the deriv derivability, it doesn't have much to do with the state of machine, does it? Yeah, so in this machine, the states are the T and the T prime, right? So the state is the expression itself, right? Yeah. Um, and so when you go across the arrow, then you, you're changing the state. Yeah, but that exactly. won't become obvious until we look at the implementation of how you would actually evaluate this. So yeah, it, just think about, more, in more complicated, uh, sorry, uh, in, in more complicated machines, we have other states, for example, registers, we have memory, 
stuff like that. But for this machine, the only state is the program itself. And then we just reduce this program, basically. Mm -hmm. and, and to say that computation changes the state of machine, if we're talking about, you know, common computer with some common language C, it is in the sense that we take two memory locations, we say, for instance, add them up, and the yeah. result ends up in a new memory location, and that is the change of state. Yeah, that's it's that is a change of state. But in, yeah, in here, in here we the state we're not is talking about memories and registers, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we're are not talking, talking about, about this. Okay, but you could actually um, represent evaluation in C, yeah, like this by just writing out like all the values that are in the memory as an expression, and then the transition yeah, yeah, is exactly. like a new list of all the values in the memory after you after you change something yeah so yeah if we have an imperative language we can just say our states have more stuff instead of just the program we will have some other state in that too like yeah like registers like the memory but in this in this case because this language is so trivial we don't need that Uh, does that, this computation, this transition has some sort of graph representation or not? What do we mean by rough representation? Graph, uh, like, you know, for instance, like finance oh, state graph. machine would have a graph. Oh. Is there some graph behind this or, or not? Well, it's the tree, right? A tree is a graph. So you go from one node to tree. another. This tree that we're looking right now, that's the graph. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you, start, that's, you, you start yeah. with nothing, then you get S false, then you get T of U, then you get the big one. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I don't know. Yeah. You could have, you can think of the transition rules as the, the edges in a graph if you wanted to, but it, it's kind of weird. Because if you have multiple premises, no, it's a bit tough to swallow that one as yeah. a graph or as a tree, but I don't know. <laughs> it's still a tree. You can't have a like a deck, for example. You can't have that because uh, yeah, we yeah we they immediately talk about this like the at least in this language is deterministic. Like if we're state transition to another state, then it's the same state. Of course, we can have a non-deterministic language, then we have a graph. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. But I mean, even in that case with non-determinants, uh, it, it's like the state is just a set of states, right? And so, yeah. You can still see it the same way. When I'm transitioning, I'm just changing the set of states, right? So it's kind of the same yeah. thing. Exercise. So, um, so previously we talked about just mach what machine do one step. As but as programmers, we need to we are interested in the final result of evaluation, which in a state that the machine cannot take any step. And here is a definition that a term T is in normal form, 
if there are no evaluation rule applied to it. But also that there are two possibility of normal form, like true and false are normal form. But we also may be stuck. Is that right? Not, not yeah. until later, once they, when you add in both the arithmetic too. Yeah. I guess in here still like if t is a normal form, then t is a value. If yeah, if we just have this Boolean language, then it's the case. And yeah, every value is normal form. In this Boolean language, we can guarantee everything will become true and false eventually. And Even also the numbers would become true and false. No, no, if we don't consider the numbers, hmm. if we just consider, yeah, this subset of the language. Right. If we consider the numbers, then there will be funky cases where if some number, which is not valid, So also there is a multi-step evaluation relation. It's a reflective transitive closure of one step evaluation. So this is also introduced in chapter two. And yeah, multiple step evaluation is like, um, it's a smallest relation that we can, This is a transitive rule and where's the reflective? Two, two is reflexive. So it, yeah, it, it is like adds an extra rule that's not in the, the other evaluation rules that we saw before where you, you can transition to back to your, the same expression. Yeah. So basically we are Basically, we are defining this as like previously is one step, and now it's like one or more step. Kind of like zero or more. Because of the and reflexivity. It's, yeah, and it's kind of like a, uh, it's a monoid, right? You know, it has a zero and a plus operator. Yeah. Also, we can see the normal forms are unique because our language is deterministic. And yeah, but of course we need to prove that actually. And it also talks about like, this is a termination proof in computer science have the same basic form. And yeah, in this language, we don't have like constructs such as loop or recursion, so it's guaranteed to terminate. 
that we can observe that each evaluation step reduces the size of ter the term. We always reduce the size, so it eventually will becomes a constant. We are a little bit behind the audio one. Only like 80 some minutes past. Uh, next job is to extend the definition of your evaluation to arithmetic expressions. So we have a lot more rules for arithmetics. Uh, this means we, this means like suck also means it sucks, it's strict, it means we always need to evaluate what's inside first and then who gets the suck. And also the predecessor of zero is still zero. I guess this is a funky definition, but Otherwise, we can't define predecessor. It, it could have been set of integers. Yeah, if we want to have integers, then predecessor of zero can be some. But but then, if we have integers, we we shouldn't define it in this way because we will have some duplications like the predecessors of the predecessors of zero but what about the successor of zero's predecessors predecessor it sounds like the same yeah. thing i, I so, guess you have to have something right predecessor of zero has to be something right because it's a rule yeah well, or it could be a stuck expression, right? So you could just say, well, predecessor of zero can't be reduced to anything less than that. Right, like successor, successor of zero to represent two doesn't move forward. It's still two, it's fine, but it's, yeah. you know. And it's, actually that's a way that you couldn't define integers, I guess, right? right? Because right. Uh, you could, you, if you had this, I guess, do they have mm. that in there? They don't actually have successor of predecessor. Well. They, but the it thing, is, if you if you work through this, because of the prede predecessor rules, the predecessors can always basically be eliminated if you have a, a term, right? So in this model, you can always end up just destroying all your predecessors if you're representing in numbers. But if you wanted to represent neg negative two, for example, you get into weird stuff where it's like, okay, it, does this term representing negative two mean the other? Like you could represent negative numbers in different ways and suddenly equality becomes a bit of a weird problem. Whereas in this model, mm -hmm. it's like, well, if you have two, you have two. Like two is always yeah, gonna be yeah, stuck exactly. zero, right? Yeah, it, it means like successor can be used for value and a predecessor will always be evaluated. And we finally talk about stuck because now we have something which can be in the normal form, but not a value. Like for example, is zero false? We don't have any rule for that. When we say value, do we mean term? What does value mean now? Thinking in this, yeah, it's in this... a subset of the term. It's on the left. It's the v, it, it, there's the, the v, v and yeah. the NV. Those are two categories, which those are we're just calling them values. Um yeah. it, it just it just is, yeah, it's a subset of the terms. And like you know, successor of zero is in there, but successor of false isn't in there. Yeah. So value previously includes the 
true and false. And then we also add numeric values, which is either zero or successor of a numerical value, which means basically means just zero and successor, successor. And predecessor is not a value. It will always be evaluated. And also is zero will always be evaluated. But not always, but when it can't be evaluated, we call it get stuck. So we have two different zeros now, if you scroll up a bit. So we have a numeric, we have a constant zero and we have a zero value. Is that the same thing? It's the same uh -huh. thing because yeah, val value is a subset of the terms. So like, yeah, the term has a like zero term and the, the value have a zero value. It's the same thing. Okay. But it is it is common in language definitions to have terms and values be different things, right? And when you evaluate yeah. a term, it always produces a value, which is a, it's a different thing. Yeah, not a subset of the terms. Uh, I'm I'm struggling to understand the difference between V and NV. So V is numeric values, and NV is still numeric values. Oh, V. Remember, we have a boolean before. Uh huh. We we also include booleans. In which one? Like true and false. In V or NV? Yeah. So the reason they mm -hmm. split up NV into a separate thing is because it's recursively defined. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so NV but, is numeric values, whereas right. V also includes booleans or not. Yeah, so yeah, B has true and false yes. and NV, right? Okay, but you so can't take the successor true of true and false. So okay. NV has to be a separate definition. So you can recurse just on the numeric values. Yeah. Because it doesn't say that V includes numeric values in this table, does it? Well, uh, they add them like see the dot 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 like v include numeric values but they v also include the true and false they just put them separately hmm, okay so the evaluation rules they only apply to numeric values now not to the booleans right so you cannot define a successor of a boolean is this a different just, thing or are we adding new stuff on top of the previous one yeah we add new stuff on top of the previous one so how do I know from a evaluation rule it doesn't apply to booleans and only for uh, to the numerics based on just looking at the notation? Well, certain times you can't like suck of NV1, pred suck of NV1. NV1 has to be a numeric value. I, I agree. Yeah. I agree with that, but uh, like how do this, I know from the notation? The, this is the point. That's, this is that kind is, of the, the point of this is that like, we have this notation, we can write out these expressions that we can't reduce, even though we look at them and they're like, oh, that's wrong. Like that's, this is, this is like the thing at the end of all of this is that with type systems, you get away from this, but here we don't have that. So we can write nonsense expressions and it's, it's an expression that, you know, you can write, but it's not, it's weird. That's why we talk about stuckness. Yeah. So, so if it's a T, you can use Booleans or numeric values. If it's an NV, you can only use numeric values. That's the distinction. Like ESUC, e you can apply to Booleans. I know I can't, but who tells me no, that? <laughs> you can. ESUC, you can apply to Booleans. If oh. T1 is... It? T1 reduces to T prime. So it's like an if then else. You can yes. reduce, you can do the conclusion. Okay. It's just you'll end up yeah, with something like suck of false, which doesn't mean anything. It's which like will be stuck. You, you, stuck you, can, yeah. you, can, you can write suck of false, but you won't be able to evaluate it with the evaluation. Yeah. Rules. So I just get stuck basically. Suck of false, it doesn't get me anywhere, but I may end up with it, right? Sure. Oh, okay. So now it's clear. Yeah.
And stuckness means that it gives us a notation of so-called runtime errors. And yeah, in a more concrete implementation of the language, those uh, runtime errors will manifest in different kind. Well, we don't want set for the execution of illegal instructions, but yeah, it also can be just a runtime exception. And also this exercise talk about, we can explicit it encode the meaningless states of abstract machine. Like if I introduce a new term called wrong, but this exercise, we will leave that for later. And another exercise talk about the big step semantics. which is more succinct, but it also omits too much details. Well, big step is, is good for actual evaluation. Whereas yeah, small step it is like how, uh, yeah, how an interpreter is, how an at least naive interpreter can be just in, implemented like that. But yeah, it, it has a problem that it cannot distinguish of non-termination from stuckness. Even though in this language we don't like it's the same. Also, and we are in the chapter four, which talk about implementation. And yeah, I encourage you to look at this implementation or if you want to do it. I think I will do it before the next meeting. So this particular implementation is in OCaml. But other language can do that too. Oh, hey, we see Harper here. And but and it talk about two features that are very important for this kind of things. One is pattern matching other is garbage collection. So if you do that in Java, it will be more difficult because it didn't have pattern matching. I think it have it now. I don't know how easy it is to use because it doesn't have algebraic types. And uh, for language like C, it's even harder. But yeah, if you want to do an interpreter in C, it's yeah, totally doable. Just like more bullet plates. So for representer, when we use the algebraic data types, this info here is. I think nowadays we usually call it a span. This describe where, so the location of the node in the source file. And this is just used for error reporting purpose. And we can ignore that. Yeah, if you, so the comment about if doing it in Rust, we need to box. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you basically can do that in any language. Just yeah, different difficulties. And we have this is numeric value helper to check whether something is numerical. Zero is a numerical value and the successor of something is numerical value if this something is a numerical value. Remember this, we have the first uh, first member is the info. That's why we just use well, uh, wildcard to ignore that. And everything else is not a numerical value. This is how we do recursive functions in OCaml where we need a rec keyword because OCaml does not support recursion by default. Uh, we need to explicit add this keyword. That's how we can yeah, use new micro value in here. Also, yeah, also it has a comment that like the the book used some Unicode where in reality in the actual code it will be uh, like two characters. And also we can have a is value function, which is similar. And the is value doesn't need to be recursive because it's just like say, we just have cases true and false or if something is a numerical value, none of them like recursive on is value directly. But for more complicated language, then this well may need to be recursive. And now we come to the actual evaluate function where we just implement those rules directly. And that's how that's why we talk about those rules, because it can be directly operational semantics can be directly translated into code. And each one rule is uh, corresponding to one branch in the card pattern machine. And then the book use exception to so say if we have no match, then we just show an exception. Also, here is uh, here is an eval function. We we try to try to do eval one like, and then call eval recursively. But if we don't have have an exception, then we just return the current term.
But however, this is not efficient. We are doing like small step implementation where we can actually just do a, using the big step semantics. And then that's this exercise. So instead of doing an eval one, we need to rewrite this whole thing to become another pattern matching using the big step semantics. And also, also the rest of stories is like, we need to do something like lexing and parsing. Also some other printing, for example, boilerplate code. If you do it yourself, then yeah, you need to implement those stuff on your own, basically. I was wondering that comment at the bottom, uh, like two in the sub, we write eval putting a try handler in recursive loop, but it's not very good style. Like, yeah, what, what's the reason behind that? It's not a good style to use exception in this way. We are using exception for control flow, and again, so, so like it's, use it's, option instead, or yeah, or something option. else. Yeah. Use option. Yes, I think it's like option. Yeah, I mean, even better would be a result of like a result type where you can actually provide, you know, yeah, information right? okay. yeah. type, yeah. which is basically you know that's kind of the norm. But this is kind of like, well, it looks ugly if you do that here. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it so looks I ugly, the, especially. Go on. The problem with exception handling is that it goes around the type system, right? There's no way to tell if we look at the type of eval that you can't tell that it's throwing exceptions. Yeah. That's why it's bad style. Okay. I guess, yeah, I think when I initially read it, I thought he was just saying like in the eval, use something other than try, like use exceptional handling there, but like you'd also have to change this eval one, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. So I actually wrote a different version in a Haskell-like language that I can show you guys if you want to stick around afterwards. That yeah, does use yeah, a sure. maybe. Yeah, definitely using maybe or better uh, result. Or in Haskell, it's called either. It's a better option. In OCaml, I think in, in the books area, there are no monadic operations probably. That's why they, they use this approach because the code is simpler. But nowadays, there are libraries to do like monadic operations for you. And so even you use, for example, maybe it will not be much more complicated than this. Yeah. All right, maybe let's stop recording and yeah, we can just stay along if you want to chat. Yeah, I go a little bit farther and I try to do one of the proofs um, if anybody's interested. <laughs>